Okay. Um, hello, world. It's Siraj. Welcome to my live stream. My other live stream uh, software was, you know, technical issues, so that's not happening. But anyway, in this video, we're going to perform some quantum machine learning. It's some very exciting stuff. Uh, there's some people in the in the other live room that need the link to this video, so I'm going to go ahead and post it in that in the uh, video description for that. Okay. Um, so anyway, so we're going to talk about quantum machine learning in this video. I've got some great. Um, I've got some great topics to cover. There's a lot, actually. There's there's so much to cover here, um, but uh, let me just pack that in. Make sure everybody's coming into this live stream that we have going on right now. Everybody's in. Okay, cool. Just a slight little technical error. It happens, and uh, now we've got people in here. Great, 280 viewers in here. Okay, so let's just get right into this code. Um, oh, before we get into the code, I just want to say something. I want to say that. D-Wave, D-Wave went ahead and invited me to their office in Vancouver, and it was uh, it was a pretty cool experience. And uh, seeing is believing, so I can I can I can definitely say that I saw a quantum computer myself in person. I met some really cool people there, and I I just I'm I'm a believer now. I'm a believer in the power of quantum computing to help accelerate machine learning applications and and to help us create new types of algorithms that we did not think are possible. Uh, so in this, in, this, in this video, I'm going to um, go over quantum mechanics, quantum computing, including the hardware, and how qubits work in, in terms of the hardware. And then we're going to demo some machine learning applications, OK? So I'm going to go ahead and screen share. So unfortunately, we might not be able to see each other uh, while we do this, but um, that's just how it goes. And I'll, I'll be answering questions as well. So let me go ahead and move that out of the way. And it looks like screen sharing is working. Great. So let's go right into this uh, lecture we have here. Okay. We here is our lecture. Let me let me let me make sure everybody's in this in this chat room. By the way, we've got a lot of people who need to be in here, and uh, I just want to make sure that uh, the links are working. You know, everything's working. Let me make sure everybody's in. All this. right. Cool. People are listening. There's got there are 500 people watching this. Uh, th this this thing right now. Okay, so okay, so you guys can hear me, right? Right. So here's here's how here's how we're gonna do this. Um, I want to see uh, the I want to see people quality's low, right? Let me let me make it better. Let me make the quality just a little bit better by making this bigger. And uh, hello from Brazil, right? Everybody's there. Okay, so here we go with this. Let's let's get right into this. Okay, so first of all. Um, what is quantum mechanics? So quantum mechanics is now you see me. I'm a screen recording. Then that's just going to be in the corner. So I'll be in the corner. Okay, cool. All right. So you know whatever works for now. Whatever works. Okay. So um, what is quantum mechanics? Uh, quantum mechanics is uh, at the subatomic level. Things are different. Okay, TLDR. Things are different at the subatomic level. Matter is quantized. Energy is quantized. Momentum is quantized. Meaning there are some really strange phenomena happening at the at the subatomic level, at the level of particles, of electrons, things like that. So the official definition is. Quantum mechanics is the body of scientific laws that describe the motion and interaction of photons, electrons, and other subatomic particles that make up the universe. Okay, so very exciting stuff. So if we were to flip a coin, okay, so here, here's an example. If we were to flip a coin in our reality, we are used to one truth, okay? That coin will either fall on heads or it will fall on tails, right? It's going to be either one or the other. And... Um, Make sure that I'm over here in the in the corner. Okay, um, right. It's either going to be heads or it's going to be tails. And so we're used to one truth in our reality. We're used to one truth in our reality. And but at the quantum level, there are multiple truths. A coin can be in both heads and tails at the same time. So in our reality, when we flip a coin, we're, okay. So I'm, I'm demonstrating. We flip a coin. We look at it. We know that it's going to go up. We know that it's going to go down. We know that it's going to land on heads or tails. There is one truth. But at the subatomic level, at the, at, the smallest, if, at the smallest level of the universe, the laws of physics behave differently. There are multiple truths. And we can prove those multiple truths 
mathematically, what do I mean? Let's assume that I'm gonna flip a coin as a particle. So I'm, I'm now Siraj at the subatomic level. Now at the subatomic level, when I flip a coin and I don't look at it, that coin is going to eternally just be flipping in midair. It's going to be both heads and tails at the same time. It's gonna be both heads and tails at the same time. These are both completely true at the same time. A coin can be in both heads and tails. A particle can be in two different states at the same time. These are both completely and 100% truths, okay? And I don't say realities because this is happening in our reality. And so if I observe this coin, then immediately it will pick heads or tails. And when I say observe, that doesn't mean a conscious observer. That means any kind of measurement, either human, non-human, machine, any time that that coin is measured by any device, anything, then it will pick either heads or tails. And while it's in the air, it is going to be a probability of heads and a probability of tails at the same time, say 70 and 30%. So how do we describe this kind of crazy uh, behavior, right? This is wild, this is wild. Well, it turns out we can describe this behavior mathematically. And this is what quantum mechanics is all about. Okay, let me make sure everybody's following here. Uh, Rob, wow, great, 737 people here, great. So, um, okay, so there was this experiment called a double slit experiment. And I'm gonna answer some questions after I get through this before I start coding. I will start coding, by the way. So uh, there's this experiment called a double slit experiment. And how it works is you take an electron beam gun, so it's just beaming out light, and it goes through two slits, and then it's gonna land on the screen. And what's gonna happen is, when we do this, we're gonna see this number two that's on the right here. Let me, let me make this a lot bigger. We're gonna see this number two uh, image that's on the right here. So it's, it's gonna be, we're gonna be able to observe what is called interference. So two different waves through, the, through both of those slits will interfere with each other. And that's kind of weird, right? Because we would assume that either light is made up of particles or it's made up of waves. Well, it turns out that light is both actually. It's both a particle and a wave. And we can describe this mathematically using what's called Schrodinger's equation, okay? How do we describe the properties of light? How do we describe this particle wave duality that light is? And this is happening at the quantum level. So Schrodinger's equation helps describe this particle wave duality. And in the red, that is Schrodinger's equation. And it's actually based off of a lot of different you know, theories in physics, what the, what, how do we compute kinetic energy, potential energy, conservation of energy? So there's actually a lot of theory behind it. And we're not going to describe that right now. But just so you know, things behave differently at the quantum level. And so the reason I talked about this example is that quantum computing, quantum algorithms exploit three features from quantum mechanics. And those three features are, number one, superposition. Remember when I talked about the coin flipping and then just being in midair and, and being both heads and tails? That's called superposition. In midair, a coin can be in both heads and tails at the same time. That's superposition. Um, and here's a great image of that. I know it's in French, but uh, ça va, bonjour. No, I love French. But th this was the best image I could find on, on the idea of superposition. Now there's a second feature, it's called interference. Now don't worry if none of this makes sense yet, by the way, I just really wanted to describe quantum mechanics, okay? I, I just think it's so cool. It is so cool, I don't think, it is so cool. So where were we? So superposition is the second uh, feature, right? So oh, that's the first feature. The second feature is interference, right? So those waves in the double split experiment, when those waves collided with each other, that's interference, they overlapped and canceled each other out. And the third uh, feature is entanglement. Now, this is this is kind of hard to even explain in the context of um, classical mechanics or in the context of anything that we know of, right? This is actually quite an interesting, um, this is quite an interesting phenomenon. But TLDR, uh, uh, two particles that are entangled affect each other. So if you observe a particle here, it's going to affect the other. And there is no amount of distance that matters. Like this could be across the universe and two particles could be entangled across the universe. Okay, so those are the features of quantum mechanics that quantum computing um, utilizes or exploits. So we know that a bit in classical computing can either be one or zero. And in quantum computing, a bit can be 
both at the same time, a qubit. It's called a qubit. Now, a lot of us have heard the term qubit, right? We, we've heard this term, but what really is physically, what, what physically is a qubit, right? So before we get into that, a quantum computer is using qubits to supply information and communicate through the system. Okay, it can be, in, and so one really simple way to demonstrate the power of qubits is to think about the example of me using a, thank you, Salim, I appreciate that. So, so a, an easy example is uh, thinking about writing a random X on a page Okay, I'm just going to write an X on a page in a book, and I'm going to put it in a library with a million other books. Now, classically, we would have to sort through all of those books to find the X. But in a quantum computer, a qubit in superposition can be in multiple places at once simultaneously. So it can analyze every page at the same time and find X instantly. Now, that is a theoretical example. Because why? Why? Because qubits are a lot of fun, okay? Unlike classical computers, they can be in a superimposed, a super, superimposed state. Now we are all used to classical uh, CMOS transistors. These are silicon transistors. CMOS stands for comp complementary metal oxide semi semiconductors. And the way they encode and access information is by using voltage, right? So zeros and ones. What really represents zeros and ones? How do we create these states? these binary states. Well, the way we create them is by using electricity, right? Voltage. The voltage of a transistor is addressed by a bus, which is able to set it to a state of either zero or one. That's how transistors work. That's how the computer you're using works. But in a quantum machine, instead of using that, they use a squid, a superconducting quantum interference device, essentially a quantum transistor. Now, what does a quantum transistor look like? Well, it's used, it's, instead of using silicon, it's using a metal called niobium, okay, niobium. And this is a very, very interesting metal, niobium. I saw it myself, actually, at D-Way. Very cool stuff. But this metal is called niobium. And the, the, the really interesting property of niobium is that when we cool it down to absolute near absolute zero temperatures, like really freeze, freeze this thing, then it's going to it's going to be become known as it's going to become a superconductor that starts to exhibit quantum mechanical effects. What do I mean? So here's an example of a qubit built with this niobium metal. And so what happens is instead of encoding states using electricity, we are encoding states using magnetism, which is, you know, still based on electricity, right? Electromagnetism. But the idea is that when we, when we cool this niobium metal, it's going to create this magnetic wave in either up or down, the direction of either up or down. And that's going to allow us to encode uh, two states as tiny magnetic fields, right? These can be plus one, they can be minus one, and they can be plus one and minus one at the same time, which is super cool. And so by adjusting a control knob on our computer, we can put all of these qubits, right? These little magnetic, um, like magnetic coils. Uh, coil is not really the right word here. These magnetic um, superimposed uh, particle qubit states, we can put them all into a state which we can entangle them, right? We can entangle them. So what happens when we take a single qubit and we try to um, couple them with other qubits so that we can have a more powerful quantum computer? How do we do that? So here's what it looks like. So in this, in this image, we are seeing these strips, these gold strips. These are, these are qubits. So there are eight qubits here, four by four. And the blue dots represent what are called couplers. There are couplers for these qubits. And what the couplers do is they're made from superconducting loops. And they put many elements together. And they allow these qubits to interact with each other. And right, the more qubits we have, the, the, fa the, the faster our computer is. And in fact, we see an exponential speed up, where n is the number of qubits. Um, you know, it's, it is an exponential speed up the more qubits that we add. Right, so it's a magnetic field going through this superconductor, and we are putting currents on either end of what are called Josephson junctions, um, which allow for this magnetic field to be created, 
um, this quantum mechanical field that can represent two states at the same time when it's cooled. And so the really interesting bit about the QPU, the quantum processing unit, is that there are no large areas of memory. We're used to CPUs. We're used to von Neumann architecture, right, where we have, we have a processor and then we have memory. But in a quantum computer, both the processor and the memory are interpolated together. So it is both processing data and it's storing data at the same time. In that way, it is very similar to neurons in the brain in that we can think of qubits as neurons that both process data and um, store, store data as well. And we can think of the couplers as synapses that are connecting these neurons together. Okay, so super, super cool stuff here. And who provides these computers? Well, D-Wave, obviously. IBM, Google, Microsoft, Intel, a lot of big players are working on this right now. Um, and we're, we're going to start seeing a lot of startups come into this space, which is why I am talking about this, because the time is now. The time is now for those of you who are hungry to build uh, applications for the world that are going to solve real business problems. The time to use quantum computing is now to speed up existing machine learning algorithms and create entirely new classes of machine learning algorithms that did not exist before. And I'm going to show you how to do that in this video. Now, D-Wave has a lot of patents. When I was there, I literally saw a massive wall of patents, uh, which is good for them, right? You know, market share, um, that's going to be good for them. And then there are others. And so they've been building a, a, a stronger and a bigger and a faster quantum computer over the past couple years. Um, and so, so that, that, that's what that space is like. Okay, so here's the big question. Are they faster than classical computers, right? That is the big question that we want to answer here. Are they faster than classical computers? Right? I like the way you guys think. So uh, the answer is for some problems, OK? It's not like they are going to completely replace conventional classical computers, but they will augment them. They will augment them, and they will think of them as ASICs, right? Think of them as specially special devices for a specific set of problems. Just like we think of CPUs, that are, CPUs are great at, at processing sequential data. GPUs are great at matrix operations. Uh, quantum computers are great at solving problems that involve quantum data. So anything involving a simulation where you're trying to simulate our universe because our universe operates using both classical and quantum mechanics. And that is in fact why Richard Feynman wrote the paper on this you know, a couple decades ago, because he envisioned a, a computer that could simulate reality perfectly. And the only way to do that is to use um, a quantum computer so that we can simulate quantum mechanics. And uh, right, so, so there's that. We can use it to speed up machine learning algorithms. We'll get into that in a second. Um, and so it's actually really hard to build a quantum computer as well. Um, we can think of this whole process of quantum computing as a process of engineering the pattern of a complex set of waves, these electromagnetic waves, in hopes of channeling that flow towards the correct answer. So in machine learning, we are used to defining an objective function, right? We got this objective function, we're going and then we're going to learn a function with the proper coefficients using some optimization scheme, like say gradient descent, to then solve that objective. And you know we might have some constraints. Now, in the quantum world, when we are doing quantum machine learning, that same idea is there of us defining an objective, but there is much more of an emphasis on defining what the constraints of the problem are, because it's it's like defining the constraints of the problem and then just like letting these waves interact in ways that we have no idea how they're gonna interact and then hopefully it's gonna come up with a solution to our problem, right? We don't know what that answer is going to be, but we can define the constraints of the problem, you know, threshold values and, you know, lower bounds, things like that. And then we'll converge on the function, okay? And that's kind of hazy, we'll get, we'll get more details in a second here. But there's another problem with quantum computers is that they, they fall into this decoherent state, right, uh, where, uh, basically, there are leaks, there are these quantum leaks, and it's really hard to keep them all in this coherent state where they're entangled, they're working together, and they're, they're used to compute things. You know, it's, it's, it's the mixture of variables involving cooling and, you know, things like that. So 
It's hard. And a lot of times it's not worth the effort to build a quantum computer when you could just solve a problem classically. So what are the applications of quantum computing? Now, uh, there are a lot. These are being used in production. So from cryptography to medicine to obviously machine learning, searching for, you know, in big data sets. And I've actually got a giant list here for different industries and how quantum computing can be used to solve problems in these industries. So definitely check this out. You know, a lot of different industries here. Um, and so even D-Wave, they, they've got this great uh, landing page that shows their clients and what they're using for, using quantum computing for. So from Volkswagen, Booz Allen, you know, recruiting, NASA's using it, um, material simulation, like I said, um, like Feynman envisioned, Monte Carlo simulations, things like that. And so we can think of the stage that quantum computers are at now at the same stage that classical computers were in the 50s, right? Still very introductory technology. We have some basic idea of how these, how this hardware works. But think about classical computing. You, you don't think that the people designing the CPUs in the 50s had any idea that apps like Facebook and, you know, et cetera, that the apps that we all use um, would actually exist. It's such a, it's so, it's so far off from the original idea of a, you know, of, a, of, a, of, a, of the hardware. So here's, here's, the real, here's the real question. How can it be used for machine learning? So when I was there at D-Wave, when I was there at D-Wave, I was very um, happy with uh, the, the, the team. They answered a lot of my questions, a bunch of quantum scientists. We all sat in a huge circle and just, I was asking them, them questions left and right. And this is such an exciting field of study of research. Quantum computing is such an exciting field because there's so much to discover still. But there are four known ways that it can be used for machine learning, including optimization, sampling, kernel evaluation, and of course, you know, gleefully we 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 look at this and think, oh yes, linear algebra. Why? What do neural networks use? They use matrix operations. What speeds up matrix operations? GPUs. Why? Because they do them in parallel. Could we speed them up even more using quantum computers? I, I, I definitely think so. I definitely think so. And in fact, we're going to look at a paper in a second that does that. So they will speed up some existing algorithms and enable a new type of algorithm as well. Okay, so some images. And so let's look at Leap, right? So let's look at their software. That This is what they demoed. To, to me in Vancouver when I was there. So if you go to the dashboard here, they've got some they've got some demos. They've got an SDK installed. They've got a QPU dashboard, and uh, we I've, we've got one hour of QPU time, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you think about how fast a quantum computer is, you can compute a lot of things in milliseconds. So that that hour is actually quite a lot for a free tier, right? This is free for all developers to use. Now, here is the coolest thing here, and then here's where they really got me. Um, there are Jupyter Notebooks in the browser, and we can compile these quantum uh, algorithms in the browser. So let's, let's look at a demo here um, first, and this is called social network analysis, and then we'll look at the code, and I will, I will code myself as well. Okay, so let's look at this optimization problem here. Okay, so this is an example social network from Romeo and Juliet. Okay, so we all know the story of Romeo and Juliet, two star-crossed lovers from different families that th these families were enemies, but then they fell in love. And so there was that new connection that was forged, right? Okay, let me move this out of the way so that, all right, great. Oh my God, move, 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 hold on. Sometimes you just got, there we go. Oh, show to continue. Okay. So at the start of the story, where are we at the start of the story? There is a river that, 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 that cuts, that um, divides these two communities, right? Um, there's a river that divides these two communities. And they all are connected with each other. And then they have um, connections across the river that are negative, right? These are enemy connections. But between each other, they have friend connections. And then all of a sudden, Romeo and Juliet fall in love, and a new connection is formed in this graph, this social graph. And uh, this leads to instability or imbalance in the network, right? Because 
what ideally we want is, is there to be no connection between both groups. We want the, a balanced network in this case would be one where there are no um, positive connections between the families. So how do we uh, rebalance this? So the way we would do this in a quantum computer is we would uh, set the degree to which two variables agree, and that's the qubit's coupling strength, strength and then the, the degree to which a variable tends to a particular outcome, and that is the bias. And we're going to look at this programmatically in a second. But basically, we can rearrange that graph so, such that, in a way that, uh, there is no enemy connection across the river, and the graph is, in fact, balanced again. And we can use a quantum algorithm to do this. Okay, so you know this this applies to you know same exact thing is happening here uh, with this Syrian extremist thing, and we hit run, and then it's it computed this structural imbalance problem. And so, what better way to demo how this works than to look at code? So, if we go to developer tools here. They have, or learning in docs, Jupyter Notebooks in the browser that we can just start looking at right now. Let's, let's check this out. Beautiful. The kernel's ready. Great. Good. OK, here's the kernel. So what are we doing here? So let's just compile this. So here is a toy example. Nothing quantum is happening here in this like little, let me make this big. Nothing quantum is happening here, okay? All that's happening here, make this bigger, is we are building this network graph, right? We are building a network graph, and um, there is a hostile relation, a set of hostile relationships and a set of friendly relationships. That's it. And then we can initialize a solver, okay? And the solver, I'll explain what the solver is doing here. Um, and then we'll take that solver and we'll use it to sample from the possible outcomes. Okay, so we have this solver and it's going to solve that problem by sampling from the set of possible outcomes. And when we perform that, it's going to show us the frustrated relationships and then rebalance the graph. And we can even visualize that right here. Okay, so it, it rebalanced the graph. We didn't see how it worked. You might be wondering, uh, we did see it work, but we didn't get to see this like little visualization thing because a million things go wrong in demos, guys. But the, but the point is that we just, com we just computed a quantum algorithm in the browser, and now I'm going to code it myself. So don't worry if you don't understand what the solver itself is doing. I'm going to code that myself now, and then we're going to look at what the solver is doing. Also, let me answer some questions. I haven't been answering questions. Mad fast, right? What are the questions here? Uh, the questions are uh, numerous. Any questions? So SGD, oh, great question. So SGD will be useless with quantum ML? No, 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 no. Gradient descent is not going anywhere for the time being. Um, but we could think as the analog of gradient descent in the quantum world as simulated annealing. Well, not simulated annealing, quantum annealing. because. Quantum annealing is all about energy minimization, right? We are trying to minimize some energy in a system. And simulated annealing is used a lot by physicists to try to minimize the energy in a system. Quantum annealing is the analog of that um, to the classical world. It's also the analog to, it's also the analog to um, gradient descent in the quantum world because gradient descent is Gradient descent is trying to optimize um, a landscape, and it, it always optimizes for the local minimum, right? The local minimum. But what simulated annealing does is it optimizes for the global minimum. Things that SGD, SGD stochastic gradient descent, cannot necessarily reach. Uh, so there is hope, right? Because a global finding a global minimum is better than finding a, a local minimum. Now, gradient descent has a bunch of, uh, right, exactly, Jim. So, so there are a bunch of tricks in stochastic gradient descent to try to um, improve its uh, its abilities to optimize, right? 
momentum, atom. There's a bunch of techniques that try to get it over the, the giant hill that it has to go over. Um, so yes, um, there is an analog. It's called simulated annealing. And there's a lot of research in that direction. Okay, so let me answer one more question, then we're gonna get into some math. How can we learn ML in QPU? So it turns out, check this out, check this out. I'm gonna blow your mind in a second. Check out this uh, website, quadrant.ai. Deep learning with a lot less data. What? 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 What the, what is, <laughs> this is a D-Way business, okay. The power of generative learning, you have my attention. You have our attention. What is generative? They've got a little demo here in TensorFlow, okay. Okay, uh, the thing is, I've already looked at this by the way, I'm just being theatrical here. So um, it's not using, I, I don't think, I looked at the code here, it's not, and I downloaded it. It's not using a QPU, correct me if I'm wrong guys, but it's not using the QPU here. It's um, using this probabilistic distribution algorithm instead of the quantum machine, but it's a step in that direction of using the QPU. Um, very exciting stuff. I, I met with the machine learning team when I was there. Very, very exciting stuff is happening right now. Specifically with Boltzmann machines, with sampling, right? Sampling, Gibbs sampling specifically. I met with a scientist working on taking variational autoencoders and improving their generative abilities using um, quantum algorithms. And um, there were, I met another scientist that was working on an algorithm that decides which chip to use and when to use it between a CPU, GPU, QPU, and other ASICs, right? That would be the perfect low level algorithm where you have this high level model that you define. And then at the low level, it's like, oh, I'll use a QPU for this, a CPU for this, a this, this, right? That would be very cool. So um, yeah, anyway, so that's that. Make sure everybody's on board here. Great. I'm coding on now. Okay, so, you know, I thought when I was gonna do this live stream that I would just be coding out four different examples, right? One for kernel evaluation, one for optimization, one for sampling. Well, it turns out that to even code a single example, there's so much context that I have to, you know, both learn and to convey. And so I'm going to code, I'm gonna try to code two examples, but we'll see, for time's sake, I might just, I might just code one. And for simplicity's sake, because there's a lot of, there is so much theory here. Seriously, I have never come upon any subfield of AI that I, I've never seen such um, amazing, exciting possibilities and literature. There's a lot, there's a lot. There's a, I mean, the rabbit, hole, the rabbit hole goes so deep I mean, uh, check this out, check this out. Let me show you this paper I was just reading actually before the stream. Check out this paper that I was just reading. It's called, it's literally called Quantum Machine Learning. It was published a couple months ago. Um, huge collaboration between a lot of uh, people. Beautiful um, introduction. I mean, they start off with um, like human nature and Ptolemy and Copernicus and then get into hot field networks and Boltzmann machines. So very cool stuff, but, but, but check this out by the way. Here's something that's very cool. They're already measuring the speed ups of these um, machine learning algorithms. Quantum reinforcement learning, right? So this is a part of Move 37. So this is, uh, here's, your, here's our RL element here. Um, and in general, this is just good for reinforcement learning engineers for and researchers and everybody, right? Because quantum can be applied to all subfields, or I believe, and here's where the belief comes in. I think that there is a possibility to speed up many, not all. That, I mean, I think all has been disproven. You, you can't speed up everything in machine learning, but there is a huge possibility space. And I believe that. And we'll see as we learn more. But look look at this. There are clearly speed ups here and they've, they've denoted those speed ups here, right? Um, square root of n speed ups. So for perceptrons, those are neural networks and you know things like that. So very, very exciting stuff. All right, so let's start coding here. Let's start coding here. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start coding, and what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start coding and then talk about what I'm doing. So there is this library called Dimod. Okay, so Dimod, uh, basically it, it lets us build um, models that are suited for the quantum, the quantum machine, okay? 
Uh, Dimod, that's what that's that's what Dimod does. And uh, shared API for binary quadratic samplers. We'll, we'll get into what that is in a second. So let me just import the library now. Let's uh, define our input data, right? We 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 have to have some input data. And let me make sure this goes away. Good. All right. Let me define our input data. Okay. So our first input data is going to be called H. And so what H is is it is a binary variable. H is a binary variable. And it's got a value for both zero and a value for one. What J will be is it's going to have a single value for both zero and one at the same time. So zero and one, and that value will be negative 1.0, so negative one. Now, what is this? So H represents our linear biases, and J represents our quadratic biases. Now, now it's time to actually look at what we're doing here. Okay, so I just need to like, like start coding something. So this is called the Ising model, or the the Ising actually Ising model. Okay, um, the Ising model identifies phase transitions. So in physics, right, something is either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Or in you're right, something is either a solid, a liquid, or gas. And how do we uh, identify the transition from one uh, phase, like a solid, to a liquid, or a liquid to a gas, you know, et cetera? And so the Ising model represents this as an objective function that we're gonna that we see right here. Let me make this bigger. That's what the Ising model does. Um, hold on. Okay. All right. So that's the Ising model. And uh, he here's here's what everything defines here. So um, this this e looking thing is, is sigma notation. And what we're saying is let's take the sum of all of the uh, of all of the variables that are a part of our equation here, where n is the number of variables. Um, and s, s represents a spin. And so what this does, let, let's, let's step back for a second here, for a second. What this model is, there's a lot of physical systems that we could want to model, right? So electron from individual electrons, the collisions of entire galaxies, right? So. Uh, good models can are very generalizable. They can represent the collision of galaxies and collisions at the subatomic level. And that's why the uh, icing model is a good model. It can represent a lot. This model um, was proposed by a guy named Ernst Icing, and it's used to represent that phase transition, right? So variables represent spin up or spin down states that correspond to plus one or minus one values. These are, these are um, magnetic, these are, a result of the electromagnetic um, activity, okay, of, of two particles, right? And so they it it uses discrete variables to represent the magnetic dipole movements of spin states, which are either plus one or minus one. And the data, which are just the spin states, are organized as a lattice, so each spin can interact with its neighbors. And so this is this this equation here then then represents the state of that phase transition. And it is, it is a quantum mechanical process. It is a process from quantum mechanics because it's dealing with the subatomic level. And so what we need to, what, we've, what, we're, what we just wrote here, this is quantum data, right? This represents quantum data because it's dealing with a phenomena that occurs in our reality based on quantum mechanics at the subatomic level. And it represents a phase transition. So um, this is our objective function, and what we want is for there to be a an, an equilibrium here of, of our of our spin states, so that we we reach this objective function of of up states and down states, of magnetic up and down states at the same time, right, simultaneously. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to construct this uh, icing icing model, and we can call this a binary quadratic model. It's a binary quadratic model. So using the Dimod library, there are different types of binary quadratic models. In fact, this is a superclass um, of icing. We can also create um, a Cubo model. It's a different kind I'm not going to talk about today. Like I said, there's so much that's happening here. So once we define our model, we can then sample from that model. So remember, uh, quantum algorithms are sampling from a space of possibilities. And we can sample from that model just like that. And that's that's it. We've, that, we've computed our quantum um, result that's going to satisfy this um, binary quadratic model, that, which is an icing model. 
And then we can print out what we've what we've um, approximated by seeing what's in the responses data. And I'm going to say uh, this is our sample. We have our energy, right? And we're going to print out those samples and those energies like that, right? Great. All right, let's see what happens here. Invalid syntax. Where? Mm -hmm. Oh, four, not from. Really? Okay. Um, right. Oh, this has to be a parentheses. Okay. All right, cool. So what this did is it simultaneously computed all the possible um, states that it could be in, those coefficients, and it found uh, what they are, and then we're printing them all out at the same time. So this, this is essentially we are simulating this quantum mechanical system that represents a phase transition of particles from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, et cetera. And this can, this has proven to be faster, um, faster computed using quantum algorithms over classical algorithms. Now, optimization in general, we, like we saw in the Romeo and Juliet problem, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing, right, in general. Um, right, so um, anyway, right, there's a lot of people. So there's that. Um, and there's also sampling, right? So these quantum computers can be understood as samplers that prepare a special class of distributions. And uh, right, so Gibbs sampling, things like that. Um, I want to make sure these, these people are not are in the right place. There are 100 people waiting here. That's, oh, there's 40 people. OK, good. Come here. Wrong link. Come to this one. All right, back to this. Okay, so um, sampling, that's another example. I, like, there's so much Gibbs sampling, variational autoencoders. Uh, you know, we sometimes we initialize our weights as random, and we shouldn't. Um, there, there are better ways of initializing our weights for our neural network than, than random, better than random. And, um, right, so there's a lot of potential here for sampling. Now, um, there's kernel evaluation. There's the satisfiability problem, uh, two sat problem, which is an NP complete problem. There is way too much for the single stream. There's so much theory. I don't want to overload you guys here. How are you guys feeling? There's so much. I still have so much to learn as well. Like I am totally a student of quantum uh, machine learning, and I see a lot of uh, potential there. So. Like, so uh, kernel evaluation, right? So in machine learning, there are kernel methods um, where we are we have some high dimensional uh, data and we wanna separate it by a hyperplane, right? So for classification, for example, and we can use the kernel method to um, convert that high dimensional data to lower dimensional data so we can then visualize it and have the hyperplane, hyperplane go through. So support vector machines are a good example of that. Uh, but there's also other examples as well. Um, and we can use uh, quantum algorithms to estimate certain kernels, ones that are difficult to compute classically. And the last thing here is linear algebra. Now, this is really, I think this is gonna blow the, this is gonna blow the lid off of uh, everything. Like if we can really get these quantum computers to operate as neural networks, you know, if we can interpret the matrix describing a quantum gate as a linear layer in a neural network, we can visualize how the gate would connect inputs and outputs and this is a very, very exciting area of research. And uh, that's, that's in the future, right? That, that there's so much theory there, okay? So it's overwhelming, isn't it? It's a lot of stuff. More physics, right? I mean, clearly, clearly. So um, you know what? I'm just gonna stop there. I don't wanna overwhelm you guys. There's a lot here. And, and you know, if you wanna see me talk about more quantum machine learning stuff, um, definitely tweet at me, tweet at D-Wave, um, and, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get something set up. Maybe we'll do a full course on this. So that, that's for later. We're, we're still working on Move 37 right now, and um, we have a lot of work to do as School of AI deans. 
Um, everything is always going to be free. Uh, all my education will always be free. Don't don't even worry about that. Um, but it's a super exciting time, and I'm 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 glad to I'm glad that you guys are here. I'm I'm, I'm excited to continue with this uh, uh, this stuff. And uh, yeah, that's that that's uh, that's it for this live stream. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for being here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end this live stream. Thanks, Carson. I'm gonna end this live stream. Thank you guys for coming. And for now, I've got to go um, work on some curriculum stuff. So thanks for watching. All right, let's love you too. I love you guys. Okay. <laughs>